Okay, Kanot uh, and Naseem, so for your agreement, uh, we will start now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and uh, uh, good morning. Welcome to UNDP Pakistan's inequality debates, the third one, uh, which is based on Pakistan, UNDP Pakistan's National Human Development Report 2020, entitled The Three P's of Inequality, Power, People and Policy, which was launched in April this year by the Honorable Prime Minister of Pakistan. Um, the report uh, 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 explores these three themes as the key drivers of inequality in the country. Uh, UNDP Pakistan, uh, to amplify its dissemination, uh, has been hosting a series of national and provincial regional uh, public advocacy dialogues and activities including these pakistan inequality national webinars um, uh, to uh, promote its key messages and findings the aim of today's session is to advocate our reports policy recommendations and to engage key policy uh, stakeholders and stimulate responses and participation from Pakistan's publics and, and key stakeholders. Uh, since the summer of this year, we've held two high level policy webinars on the themes of people and policy dimensions of the three Ps. Today's third and final webinar will explore uh, whether and how the third P of power causes inequality. Uh, with this context, uh, may I request resident representative of UNDP Pakistan, Mr. Kunut Osby, uh, to deliver his opening remarks. Over to you, Kanot. Thank you so much. Uh, and I am I feel very privileged that uh, we can uh, be together here today and I can be with this esteemed uh, panel to take forward the discussion on the UNDP Pakistan's latest national human development report uh, uh, entitled The Three Ps of Inequality, The Power, People and Policy. Uh, the Honorable Prime Minister of Pakistan, His Excellency Imran Khan, launched this report in April this year in the presence of Honorable Federal Minister for Planning and the um, Chair of the NHTR's Advisory Council, His Excellency Asad Umar, uh, together also with our lead author, Dr. Hafiz Parsha, and with key development partners. I'm um, very grateful to Dr. Hafiz Parsha, the author, uh, the lead author of this seminal report. UNDP is proud to have benefited from Dr. Parsha's esteemed intellectual and policy leadership for our flagship uh, national human De development report on inequality. Um, the national human development reports that UNDP publishes are always nationally owned and produced. And I would like to thank our NHDR Advisory Council that comprise policymakers from all of Pakistan's political parties, from development practitioners, academics, and key stakeholders who guided this report. And also many thanks to the team of national authors who, who joined uh, Dr. Pasha in, in completing the report. And uh, I am also very grateful to our esteemed panelists today. Uh, Dr. Ishrat Hussain, uh, uh, and um, to join us later, uh, General Tariq Khan, uh, to also join us later, Vizina Dilani, and Mr. Haris Khalik, uh, uh, who have joined us for this very important discussion on the role of power in uh, defining and uh, perpetuating inequality. A special thanks to uh, Nassim Sera, a seasoned journalist who have agreed to moderate the session for us. Uh, so in 1990, I, I go back to 1990 very quickly, but it's a very important fundament. In 1990, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Haq from Pakistan was uh, the lead in producing the first global human development report, which uh, uh, revolutionized the thinking and on what is development uh, by introducing the concept that development does not have only to do with economic growth, but it has to do with expanding opportunities and choices for people and measuring, and he introduced an indicator measuring the development progress through quality of human life rather than just the wealth of the economy. This is a particularly 
useful way to look at inequality and how the concepts of people, policy and power are so central to inequality in the world, in the Asia region and in Pakistan as well. To make one example, we have, uh, we are for hopefully at the end of the COVID-19 pandemic. This has uh, really affected people from all walks of life in Pakistan and in the world, but it has not affected everyone equally. Uh, COVID's national experience is different across Pakistan in terms of infection impact, access to medical care, as well as access to vaccination. Fortunately, overall, Pakistan has been able to uh, ensure that vaccinations are open to people from all walks of life. And that has shown the importance of the uh, policy that puts people first and what impact that can have. The National Human Development Board 2020 shows, among other things, that uh, in Pakistan, the poorest 1% of the population holds only 0.15% uh, of the national income, comparing that to the richest 1%, whose share of national income exceeds 9% in the period 2018 to 2019. Within the report, we talk about the three pillars, uh, people, uh, power, and policy. We, we have had previous webinars discussing specifically the people dimension and the policy dimension. And this webinar will focus uh, for a uh, for a time on the, the specific power pillar. This um, power as a driver of in inequality, uh, as this report analyzes it, refers to interest groups who wield extraordinary and often imbalanced influence and privilege on national decisions and policy making, and are in a position, if they choose to do so, to push their own agendas forward causing loss to the national economy. This is where inequality comes into play. Powerful groups' accumulation of wealth and privilege maintains inequality and in many cases may infringe on the rights of others, thereby creating new inequalities. According to the UNDP Global Human Development for 2020, the next frontier, human development and the Anthropocene, power is intrinsically tied to the idea of both social and planetary balance. The report speaks of the importance of discouraging incentives and regulations that influence our decision making to promote rather than prevent planetary damage. It also highlights as strengthening existing international mechanisms that hold uh, 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 nas uh, nations accountable and build trust is key to turn ambition into action. According to the National Human Development Board 2020, the total privileges enjoyed by Pakistan's most powerful groups amounted to uh, two, uh, 2,660 billion rupees in 2007 to 2018, equivalent to 7% of the country's GDP. Uh, just as an example, uh, to divert just 24% of these privileges, to the poor could double the benefits available to them. But at the moment, these uh, uh, monetary, uh, these uh, privileges are significantly higher than what is currently uh, used as subsidies uh, to eliminate poverty. The enduring insight of the National Human Development Report 2020 is this, power is not just the ability to gain preferential treatment, exploit your network for benefits or lobby for your interests. Each one of us has power in one form or, an, or another, and it is how we wield that power that will ultimately define Pakistan and the world's course towards prosperity. Great uh, development strides can be made when, when the people who hold power choose to use this for the benefit of all. The NHDR 2020 lays out a policy blueprint, makes some policy uh, proposals that can uh, assist Pakistan on its way to inclusive, sustainable development and prosperity. Uh, one of the recommendations is, uh, is that 
governance and institutional capacity access to justice and regulation needs to look be looked at from the prism of reforms that mitigate monopolies. Uh, uh, recommendations also include reviewing privileges, improving conditions of work, and spending more on human development and social protection. As Pakistan's steadfast development and policy partner, UDP looks forward to supporting the government in achieving its mandate of mitigating inequality, poverty elevation, and human development of all. We hope that this report and also the discussion today will be one contribution towards that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Kunod, for your uh, context setting and comprehensive uh, outlay of uh, NHDR and its contribution to Pakistan's policy landscape. Uh, just to clarify that uh, General Tariq Khan is very much with us. Uh, he is having technical issues, so we are assisting him to log back in, but he has joined us uh, from the very start. Uh, the federal minister, unfortunately, has been called on uh, for a field visit by the PM, so he will be accompanying him, and Ms. Hina Jilani will join us as soon as she can. Um, may I now request uh, a UNDP Pakistan's uh, a communications analyst and member of my team, Ms. Momina Suhail, to make a quick presentation on the key findings of the NHDR, uh, and especially those pertaining to the power theme, before we move on to uh, the general discussion with our esteemed panelists. Over to you, Momina. Sure. Um, Assalamualaikum, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, let me just do that. Um, basically, I'm part of the team that worked on the NHDR, and I want to just take you quickly through some of the main um, takeaways of the report. Uh, the report shows us that inequality is high in Pakistan, and uh, this is you know, a, a consequence of a lot of complex mechanisms that uh, reinforce inequality, create it, and sort of manifest it. And so the Pakistan National Human Development Report focuses on the three P's of inequality, the three key drivers of inequality in people, power, and policy. And um, so today we're gonna be talking about power, of course. Let me see if I can just minimize that. Um, but first of all, let's give you a quick grounding, some context on the status of inequality in Pakistan today. Pakistan has high income and wealth inequality, uh, not just between provinces, not just within provinces, but also between the urban and rural divide, within marginalized and underprivileged segments of the population, such as children, youth, laborers, women, transgender communities. Um, and according to the PAMA ratio, um, which is a measure of income inequality based on the top 20% versus the bottom 20%, uh, the top 20% have seven X of whatever the bottom 20% have. Um, Pakistan has unfortunately also experienced rising interprovincial income inequality, so inequality within provinces has been increasing. Pakistan performs poorly in child, labor, and gender development. Child development actually is, a, this is a new index that we created for, for Pakistan. And um, we see that um, all provinces other than Punjab do worse than the national average. Um, Balochistan is actually one of the only provinces in Pakistan whose HDI has actually decreased over time. Um, but we see that Khyber Pakhtunkhwa has shown really fast growth um, and that Pakistan administered Kashmir has the highest level of human development in the country. So this is a quick sort of grounding of the state of inequality in the country. Now moving on to power. Um, power in the NSDR relates to groups that make use of loopholes, networks and policies for their benefit. And this is what we're gonna talk about today um, with our panel. Um, the report shows the corporate sector is the largest beneficiary of privileges in Pakistan followed by the feudal class. And it also shows that the value of privileges, as Mr. Osti said, um, of the elite in Pakistan, um, if we impute a monetary value to them, it would equal um, rupees 2,660 billion, which is actually equivalent to 7% of the GDP. Um, and then also the burden of tax rises quite gradually in Pakistan with increasing income. So the tax system is only mildly progressive, which comes into play when we talk about wealth distribution, um, also, Pakistan's top quintile benefits the most from public expenditure, um, which is interesting. And also, Pakistan um, actually spends a smaller proportion of its GDP on social protection than other regional, um, other countries in the region like Sri Lanka and Nepal. Um, and then lack of access to justice is sort of hugely skewed in the country and it's a huge source of inequality. You know, we have 3,000 judges, 1.7 um, million pending cases. 
And so that kind of thing, again, uh, sort of manifest, uh, sort of, you know, continues this conversation of power, which we need to continue having. And then, of course, there's evidence of major regulatory failures um, and um, uh, uh, monopolies and cartels in Pakistan, which, again, is another way that powerful groups uh, sort of um, manifest control and, and, and um, especially at the expense of poorer, marginalized segments of the community. So hopefully this was a very short kind of overview of the report as it relates to power. And I would like to take um, sort of hand it back to Ms. Amarazadani. Thank you, Momina, for a very succinct, a focused and sharp overall snapshot of the NHDR with a specific reference to the power theme. Uh, before I hand the floor to our session's moderator today, a quick round of introductions of our esteemed panelists uh, who will now partake in the discussion. We are very privileged to be joined today by Dr. Ishrat Hussain, uh, who is former advisor to the Prime Minister on Institutional Reforms and Austerity, uh, also previously served as Chairman National Commission for Government Reforms and was the Governor of Pakistan Central Bank. During 2016 and 17, he was public policy fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, DC. He is professor emeritus at the Institute of Business Administration, Karachi, where he previously served as dean and director. Welcome, Dr. Ishad Susain. We are also joined by, uh, and, and as soon as his technical glitches uh, are resolved, uh, by Lieutenant General Tariq Khan, retired who is former chief executive and managing director of 4G Fertilizer Company Limited, C Energy Limited and 4G Fresh and Freeze Limited, and also holds directorship on the boards of Askari Bank Limited, Thur Energy Limited and more. He is chairman of Fertilizer Manufacturers of Pakistan Advisory Council and Sona Welfare Foundation. He was commissioned in the Pakistan Army in 1977 with the coveted Sword of Honor and has also been awarded the hilal e imtiaz We are also joined by Mr. Halis Kharik, who is currently Secretary General of the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan. He's a leading poet, author, and over the last 25 years, he has successfully led, managed, and advised civil society organizations, community development projects, labor rights, movements, and human rights campaigns in Pakistan, South Asia, and Europe. Uh, Haris Khalik has also worked with the Al Khan Foundation, Amnesty International, Strengthening Participatory Organization, DAI, and various United Nations agencies, among others. Uh, last but not the least, we are joined by um, Ms. by preeminent Ms. Naseem Zehra, who is a senior Pakistani journalist and author and hosts a primetime current affairs talk show on Channel 24. She has worked as a development practitioner both at the Canadian International Development Agency and Swiss Agency for International Development Cooperation. Earlier, she, worked, she served as visiting lecturer at the School of Advanced International Studies at the Johns Hopkins University in 2006 and later at the Qaidi Azam University Islamabad in 2010. She is author also of the famous 2018 book From Cargill to the Coop, Events That Shook Pakistan. So a brief introduction of our esteemed panelists. We thank you very much and welcome you again. And over to Naseem Zera to steer the conversation from here onwards. Uh, thank you very much, uh, UNDP, Mr. Kanot, um, uh, Ms. Amara. Um, it's indeed a privilege to, um, I would say, host or moderate this, um, this event. And I think uh, something that is of, of great significance and importance um, for us in Pakistan, I have had a chance to quickly uh, go over the report and uh, I think a great, uh, um, basically, presentation, very brief but very succinct by Momina, uh, helps us to zero in on what we uh, are going to discuss today. Um, it would only be um, appropriate that we have moved from policy people now to power because at the end of the day, it seems that uh, ultimately, uh, decision making um, is done by individuals and no matter and what we've seen over the years and over the decades in Pakistan is that no matter what the hello no matter what the uh, political orientation may be ideological orientation may be ultimately the decisions that are made are made by individuals uh, given their own uh, interests etc and you know that's been discussed earlier on. So um, in terms of uh, power being um, exercised, I mean, the authority um, and decision-making over resources 
um, land, capital, privileges, etc., is really the heart at the heart of how you steer a nation forward. And when we look at human development and we look at the issues of inequality, the issue of power, who wields power at the end of the day, is the critical issue. And before I move to the panelists, a very uh, quick comment on <clears throat> when we're looking at power, I think that there is today in this world where we, you know, we have the digital power at work, we have um, you know, billion voices at work, um, and people aren't voiceless, and hence you are looking at the paradox of power today. Power has proliferated beyond just the state and beyond the uh, conventional centers. So how does that work on, and how does that impact on the question of inequality? Um, and I think the last webinar which had to do with people was, was a great one in which uh, we had people come from different um, uh, different angles and deal with the question of, you know, the role of the people, etc., and the question of whether people are vic victims or are they actually a pillar in terms of inequality. I would I would um, submit here that people, in terms of the power that they have, the power of the voice and the power of participation that they have now that they are now experiencing. I think they're not just. Uh, victims, but they are also actors. So, but let me just now move to the panelists. And if I may begin with um, uh, Dr. Ishrat Hussain. Um, uh, so you've been a part of several governments. You've seen the entire decision-making uh, process over decades in this country. And you have looked also at, um, you know, uh, international systems, how they work, and uh, we, we, when we talk of elite capture in Pakistan, we're also in some ways looking at historically the IMF um, impact and how free is Pakistan? Where are the decision makers in terms of, um, uh, you know, trying to uh, end inequality? Do you, do you uh, in your years in, inside the government, inside the halls of power, do you, do you actually see ending inequality as uh, one of the goals that um, governments uh, pursue, whether it is a political government, let's stick with the political government. Over to you, Dr. Ishtar Hussain. Thank you, Naseem. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank UNDP. I'm very pleasantly surprised because my work was on the economy of an elitist state 20 years ago. It was neither cited nor I was consulted during the preparation. So I got the invitation, Amara, and thank you very much that you considered me capable of voicing my views uh, on this particular subject. First of all, let me say that the concept of the elitist capture is an integrated approach, and it cannot be sort of divided into compartments or what the economists call as the additive function. So my first comment is, that the powerful groups and lobbies, they shape and influence the policies. And these policies benefit them at the expense of the poor, disadvantaged, valuable, vulnerable segments of the population. Therefore, there is an interwoven and interrelated relationship between power policies, and people, and you cannot actually disentangle them and disintegrate them. So that is my first submission, that if we decide to compartmentalize and think each one of these pillars of the driver, I would submit that is not a very useful approach. And that is my uh, first submission. Second, empirical research has shown on the basis of the cross-country evidence that economic growth does affect poverty. And in the 1990, we had 2 billion people below the poverty line. And today we have only 800 million people because the economic growth has lifted uh, 1.2 billion people out of poverty. But there is no evidence that high economic growth also helps inequality. And that is an unsettled question as far as economic literature is concerned. 
my own study, which has just been published in the Governing the Ungovernable, shows that we had growth and low inequality. We had low growth and no equality changes. And we had the reverse, that we had low growth and low inequality. So it is a very um, unsettled uh, question, not amb very ambiguous. And we have to think about the pattern of growth and the quality of growth, which really affects the inequality. My second submission is that now we have tremendous amount of evidence and the report makes also a very good contribution towards understanding the drivers of inequality and not the pillar and power, but what it is happening is that we have again, not only income inequality, but we have gender inequality and we have regional inequality. And these are again, very much part of a chain. They cannot be really separately uh, looked upon. And my hypothesis is that a household headed by a female with illiteracy or low literacy being in a backward district of the country belonging to an ethnic minority with poor access to basic services is likely to be poor and suffer from income, gender, and regional inequality. And I can claim that this is what is happening in Baluchistan, in the KP province with the backward divisions in some parts of the rural Sin and also Southern Punjab. So this is the probability that inequality will increase in those areas where there are ethnic minorities, where are female headed households, which have no literacy and they are belonging to a backward district. So what is needed is an integrated development projects for Balochistan, for rural Sin, for Southern Punjab, and parts of Malakan and Bihai Khan divisions. Those are the focus target groups, the Central Punjab and Northern Punjab and the urban Sin and the Peshawar uh, Valley, they have benefited tremendously. All the indicators show that Karachi, Islamabad and Lahore have very low poverty rates, very low poverty rates compared to the rest of the country. And all the investments and all the services are all concentrated. And that is also leading to the urban um, uh, labor migration. And my final submission is that we have identified in my book, and I still go by that, that there are three sectors which need reform in order to bring down the inequality. These are the financial sector where women don't have access. Baluchistan and KP do not have access to finances and the small and farmers and small medium enterprises don't have access to the financial sector. Education sector where I can claim without any doubt of being challenged because I headed IBA for eight years that a child born in a highly educated, high income privileged household is likely to succeed in obtaining admission to the top universities in the world, find lucrative jobs, marry a woman of her choice, of his choice, and the same standing, and perpetuate this intergenerational mobility of the privileged, which perpetuates the inequality. So educational reform you give access to the poor and the talented. And we did this by bringing in people from the backward areas to study at IBA at our expense has proved to be extremely powerful experiment for removing this disparity. And finally, the judicial system where the stacks are all in favor of the rich and the privileged who can hire the best lawyers, while the poor do not have access 
to the judicial system and it is very expensive and it is beyond their control. So unless you have judicial reforms, educational reforms and financial reforms, I do not think that we would have any headway as far as inequality is concerned. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ishrit. And indeed, you make a very important, very pertinent points. And what you identify as the key areas for reform, you, you talk about education, judicial reforms, you talk about the financial sector. And indeed, uh, I think that's the fundamental question that uh, these that these reforms are essential is something well established. Uh, but the question is, why does this not happen? Those who exercise power move in a particular direction. And uh, basically uh, what we see is perpetuation of privileges and a, in a direction which basically uh, means um, augmenting the already privileged class, strengthening that privileged class and doing that at the cost of ignoring the factors that you identified. And it would have been interesting, we will come back to this, uh, why is it that uh, when, when you have the governments in power, the governments who make commitments and who come to serve the people, although of course it's uh, important to note that the report identifies that and have as have the speakers that in democracy, we see that growth at times may be low, but um, the inequality also gets reduced. So we see uh, reduction in uh, poverty, we see reduction in inequality, even if there is a reduction in uh, growth relative to when, uh, when there is a military uh, uh, government in, uh, in, in power. So uh, I... I I, I, I would, I would like to... I would like to now move to General uh, Tariq Khan on this note. And uh, uh, General Tariq, the issue of uh, power, the issue of security are uh, pretty um, uh, uh, interlinked now. I mean, when we look at questions of inequality, um, uh, we uh, immediately, when we look at Balochistan, we look at um, the tribal areas, we look at other underdeveloped uh, parts of Pakistan uh, where inequality, um, where inequality basically um, is perpetuated. And as the report uh, indicates in Balochistan, inequality got, um, got worse. Uh, and we saw uh, decrease in income uh, as far as uh, individual income, as far as Balochistan was concerned. Um, obviously, this leads to uh, insecurity as well. And, and we see sources of insecurity in Pakistan. So that's one question. When the military takes power, I mean, at a very fundamental level, military taking over power leads to a nature of power play that uh, that really depletes the political uh, commit capital of a nation and engages that uh, nation and its political capital in a battle which is uh, you know at a constitutional level and a battle that basically erodes uh, um, development erodes security again concentrates power in this context in institutions and those linked with those institutions and and as we now see that that institution um, is not just involved in security that institution as a whole empire uh, which uh, which is about uh, um, you know uh, activities which have to do with um, ec economic industrial uh, activities and uh, so how do you see this uh, uh, situation, uh, the issue of inequality, if I would submit to you that uh, the institution contributes to that in inequality, it depletes the political capital that's not dealing with questions of inequality. And in some ways, 
um, the question of unequal uh, playing field when uh, the institution of the army comes in a big way into uh, into business into businesses basically Over Naseem, you thank you uh, thank you well when we talk about inequality uh, whether we the country as far as pakistan is concerned and the factors that are involved in it uh, military interference probably is not that high on the agenda as far as i'm concerned as to the causes of that inequality uh, right from the outset as far as the businesses are concerned you're talking of the uh, fauji foundation and its uh, uh, various other groups this doesn't cause inequality these are listed companies and they are on the stock exchange of which 60% are owned otherwise by the civil public so they are followed uh, they are following sccp rules and it's not the military which benefits from it in the first place in fact they create they help inequality because they have hospitals in places like brogel where the government is uh, conspicuous in its absence so they have got schools they provide free education and uh, they assist in these things the military um, uh i uh, it, it will become into a different debate whether civilian and military governments are related to the economy and the development and the local body elections and the census when was all these held how the development in balochistan when did that take place if it ever did take place what happened in fata whenever the roads were built when were they built but the and what's happening in kashmir and how free medical assistance is given to the people in northern areas and kashmir these things uh, will lead to a different debate but when we talk about equality and use power as the driver of inequality where does the word power uh, it, you know the it it's it's so the societal regulations administration and governance that i found it really lies in the term authority authority is influence that is predicated on the perceived legitimacy consequently power is necessary for authority but it is possible to have power without authority and this is actually a basic problem as far as inequality is concerned it is not about the military moving in it's about cartels it's about mafia it is about feudals it is about all kinds of other things that are influencing government so when i look at inequality in its entirety in pakistan it is anybody who's exercising power without authority he is causing an aberration now this aberration is basically um it's an effect it is not in itself the cause of inequality the cause of inequality to my mind is lack of governance or the misuse of governance now in the case of the lack of governance these influences are wielded by illegitimate powers and these are cartels drug mafias criminals land grabbers feudals religious right and it is never not even mentioned in this chapter and this is surprising because this is the main cause of inequality in in in, in the country so i was reminded that actually when i was looking through the statistics etc and when i look at the statistics i was reminded of a famous saying by andrew lang who said that you know he uses statistics like one drunken man using lamp posts more for support rather than illumination the reality of the matter is that you have a bureaucracy which is very powerful you have a police which is very powerful you have uh, patwari which are very powerful you have all these people who misuse their authority and then you have a governance which is looking the other way while everybody is doing whatever he feels like you can't control traffic on the roads we can't control our garbage we can't control anything in this country so if this happens you will find all kinds of power centers all kinds of nuisance centers and they are applying themselves the way that they want to and therefore they cause a lot of aberration and this aberration translates itself into inequality related to education to gender discrimination it relates to jobs you have a constitutional anomaly nobody wants to talk about it a non muslim cannot become a head of office in certain cases if that happens if that happens you have pakistanis who are more pakistanis than other pakistanis so this these are all causes for inequality to my mind and the military might be contributing towards it in various ways and various means but i think it's a very minor part of inequality that we are facing thank you very thank much you. Uh, thank you um while uh, while we uh, respond and uh, you know um, make our comments on this report i think it's important to keep in mind that the author of this report um uh, dr pasha is not here um uh, so let's just uh, keep that in mind and i think that uh, earlier on the comment about uh, separating the three p's i would like to say that 
uh, when we look at the report, it seems you know it seems that all those three factors are taken as interdependent. And um, uh, General Tariq, uh, you spoke about uh, lack of governance, religious right, bureaucracy in whichever way it moves. I think that's that's a whole other debate, but. Certainly, I think in a disturbed context, uh, we when a context changes and when there is power play as opposed to focus on governance, and which we would argue is an evolving, uh, uh, you know, um, evolving uh, factor facet of um, a society, state, society's existence. Then you do have there are costs attached to when you move away from the set system, which is the parliamentary system, and inequalities uh, will um, will emerge i think that that whole question hasn't in detail been looked at the report but uh, certainly i think we are talking of not only um, um, you know not a level playing field but in addition to that some of the groups that we talk about the report discusses uh, you know the privileged class the elite capture i think that military rule um, does contribute to building of that elite as well uh, so i think that um, uh, as we look at uh, uh, look at inequality the military uh, during its um, you know 30 year rule in this country has contributed and this is not polemics these are facts in terms of the groups that we are talking about that uh, basically uh, perpetuate um, inequality and uh, those interest groups are ones that have uh, patronage and uh, I think we uh, are looking at issues of, um, you know, uh, we're looking at the religious right, we're looking at extremism, we're looking at, um, you know, various sections of um, of the business community and you would, uh, and, and the landed aristocracy, I think that you would uh, agree, General um, uh, Tariq, that uh, they have received uh, not, uh, not, uh, um, uh, uh, unimportant degree of patronage uh, from from military rulers who were looking for for their own legitimacy but uh, we will come back to this in detail i think this is a good point at which to bring in our friend haris uh, khaliq uh, haris uh, the the question of um, power and um, the power elite and how do you deal with um, how do you uh, uh, minimize the role of the power elite or direct the role in a in a in a way that the interests of the uh, of the um, uh, people that uh, are either below the poverty line or in some ways i think there is now an argument in pakistan that even the middle class is being crushed so those we elect and those who we send uh, into government uh, how do we ensure that they are there to um, to minimize it, to reduce inequality? It seems that we are uh, in a situation where um, inequality persists. I mean, if you look at the and on the one hand, you've had the Pakistan People's Party, uh, which talked about roti kapra makan, which is uh, which was obviously uh, very necessary, but. Uh, was that also leading to reduction of uh, inequality? And in the same way, uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan is uh, genuinely concerned about uh, social safety nets in the society, but then he's also talking about uh, um, need to create wealth. And is that, you know, those kind of agendas, will those um, help us in just growth or, and the, on, or, or creating social safety nets? Or will we be able to move in a different direction where um, inequality, which means access to opportunity, land, capital, et cetera, will, will be possible? And what will make it possible? Uh, somebody like you with your background, um, are social movements uh, the answer uh, to this power uh, capture, elite capture? Harris, over to you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Naseem. Can you can you all hear me? Because I there is a disparity and inequality in network bandwidth also in Pakistan. So, <laughs> yeah, so I'm, yeah. I'm suffering from that since morning. Uh, but thank you very much, Naseem. And it is actually, uh, I have to thank uh, Amara and Momina for inviting me to this dialogue. And it is quite a task to speak after Dr. Rishat Hussain, uh, because it is his forte. 
and uh, my views will be a lay person's view on uh, on economy and political economy of pakistan and the structural issues that we face but as a lay person and as a as somebody who's been involved with social movements um i see it you know i would like to actually go back and congratulate undp for bringing this issue up and to to uh, uh you know to substantiate the points that poverty reduction and uh uh and you know fighting inequality are two different questions they are related but they are two different questions and it is very important to highlight this because poverty reduction doesn't necessarily mean that you are creating a healthy society and uh, for a healthy society for an inclusive plural society um which general tarik also hinted at that you know the kind of uh, um, i would actually call it um apartheid in our constitution that you cannot have uh, a non muslim muslim however capable the person is the president or the prime minister i mean now it is written in the constitution so there are things like that where um uh, you know equal citizenship is compromised where um federalism is compromised and if you look at the report even in this report but we also know otherwise uh, that's the kind of disparities we see between the four provinces that we have or other administered areas that pakistan Uh, has and and uh, you know and also in democracy i mean how can you have a functioning proper solid democracy with so many inequalities i see it i see pakistan not as a i mean the issue of inequality not as an issue of economic management by the way i see it as a political issue and that is why you know it falls under power in the three p's that you have identified in the report and we i would like to sort of not historic size but take you back a little bit i see pakistan unfortunately uh, pakistani citizens as subjects i mean they are being they are not to be included in decision making in decisions that affect their lives but they are seen as people who are to be ruled and who are to be minded uh, so it is pakistan unfortunately now it is becoming more obvious to people like us that it is the continuity of the british indian colonial rule and the institutions that we have uh, uh, you know inherited from the british indian colonial rule the political institutions the executive institutions bureaucracy or the uh, you know the permanent institutions of the state or the social institutions they are all uh, colonial heritage whether it is our uh, bureaucracy which includes you know police and executive or it is our military or it is our judiciary or it is the landed elite they are all colonial uh, uh, you know heritage and there hasn't been uh, uh, there has been a will to reform to make this uh, country run like a republic but there has been seriously insufficient reforms uh, in that respect so so th th these are the roots and then the corporate sector is dependent or colludes with the uh, uh, you know with the landed elite and with the bureaucracy and with the military to to uh, further their gains so if there is bad governance in pakistan as general tarik khan rightly pointed out there are some beneficiaries of that bad governance it is not the case that you know uh, people do not want to uh, uh, you know uh, there, there are beneficiaries to everything that is happening in pakistan i mean everything wrong that is happening in pakistan so i i think that we need to re sort of uh, uh you know uh, uh, reform the structures that we have the institutions of the state that we have the uh, the power structures that we have they need to be reformed and they have to be deconstructed because there is not just an elite capture um uh, as dr ishad hussain had said 20 years ago there's not just an elite capture of, uh, of the state of pakistan the elite which has captured pakistan is also an indifferent elite you see the kind of developments that we see in pure only capitalist economies also uh, i mean epitome of capitalism is the us you know in, in in many ways where health is an issue i mean access to health is a major issue for for people who are underprivileged but imagine a yellow bus taking every child to school and high school education in the epitome of capitalism until high school is free and is and every child has to has to go to school so i th but we are disinvesting what we are doing in pakistan is disinvesting from public institutions we have a, a very different uh, view of of uh, uh, providing services to the poor or to the underprivileged and inequality in pakistan is actually uh, i don't know i mean statistics is is not my my particular uh, you know forte but what i see from the statistics it is it is mind boggling that how can this elite think or continue to think that this country will remain viable and uh, wo jo urdu mein kehte hain ke khakam badhan how can it survive 
with such disparities and inequalities systematized uh, in all walks of life. And of course, we spoke about gender disparity. We spoke about ethnic dis disparities. We spoke about regional disparities, but they are all, all linked to us not being considered citizens by those wielding power. And uh, if you if you look at the um, uh, the the um, you know the the composition of the parliament or the provincial assemblies, look at the people and compare them with people who are who they are supposed to represent. I mean, how many, I mean, we have, we have, uh, we have done good things also. I mean, it's not only, uh, um, you know, everything that has happened in Pakistan is wrong, but uh, you, you have no representation of workers, peasants, you have no representation of you know, people coming from the, the working classes, as it were, in, in your parliament, in your provincial assemblies, in the Senate. And uh, there are four, uh, you know, minority uh, uh, reservations that we have, which are, which, are, which are good. And the joint electorate is also something that has, that has happened in Pakistan, which is good. But there is no representation of the, of the underprivileged in any of the decision-making bodies. Local governance has been an issue in Local under different you know regimes, local government was introduced in Pakistan. It is a constitutional right, but it always remains a bone of contention between political forces and uh, uh, you know the, the and the constitution actually because they are defying the constitution. And local governance gives an opportunity to people to to at least participate in their local you know in decisions that are made locally. But there are no functional or or, or powerful local governments in Pakistan. So there are multiple issues, but I think it's all linked to the colonial structure of the state. It is not just an elitist state, it is also a colonial state. And, uh, and Naseem, can you hear me? Yes, yes, very clearly. Go ahead. Right, so what do we do? I mean, yeah, so very quickly, I mean, yes, what do I we do? Uh, there has to be, you see, there, we have to actually free ourselves from the clutches of this colonial state. And not just the colonial state, but a colonial society also. And how do we do that? I mean, of course, there has to be a political process. There has to be social movements. Imagine Modi had to take back, I mean, a person like Modi, uh, you know, a fascist regime in India had to take back their decisions against, you know, on the protest of the farmers. We have to have uh, such voices uh, made, uh, you know, amplify those voices and and uh, and and invest in social movements, invest in uh, you know education, as has been said, invest in people uh, being conscious about their rights. And I think that th th these are the only ways. There is no short-term solution that I that I see uh, to to this major issue. Thank you, Nisim. Thank you, Harris. Thank you, Harris, and you make uh, some very important points, and uh, listening to all the esteemed panelists, it seems to me that there is a concern on the exercise of power and exercise of inequality in, in Pakistan, and uh, it seems that uh, the panelists are looking at it across 70 years of time, whether there is civilian rule and, uh, and uh, about, um, you know, the colonial system in, colonial in place. And so the big part is to be done. I think that's the big, this is the big critical question. And um, the report uh, very emphatically um, establishes uh, that um, inequality is uh, is uh, is a factor that that is being sustained and is not um, adequately far from adequate being uh, uh, being addressed by uh, by governments across the board. I mean, uh, we are talking about um, some degree, minimal degree of improve in terms of reducing inequality where it comes to elected governments, but at the same time, um, uh, the kind of issues that the palace raise and the report documents, it seems to us that it's really not sufficient. And, um, and it is a fact, the fundamental is to the lowest level of the society's ladder, who's, who is 
the protest and uh, and the and uh, a very obvious consequence of not doing that is what we see in this prism whichever perspective uh, you look at the whole question from whether it is a question of security or um, you know kind of um, stability security social security improvement and improvement in the quality of life of uh, people um, at the bottom ladder of the society we see that the the development is uh, really uh, in the negative i would like to just go back to uh, the panels again with with this very question and uh, i am very glad that we have panelists with with this um, uh, amazing range of diverse experience and uh, over to you dr ishrat hussain you uh, again i would repeat that you have had experience like none others um, uh, and uh, in terms of trying to deal with these very questions, the questions that the panel the panelists are raising, the questions that the report um, uh, raises, uh, are questions that you were in governments uh, trying to deal with. So, uh, what's the way forward, uh, Dr. Ishwar Susan? Let me uh, submit that 20 years ago, when I wrote about the countervailing forces against the elitist capture. I identified the local governments, the media, and the civil society organizations. As Harris very rightly pointed out, a country like Chile had to change its direction because the people came out in the street and got fed up with the kind of policies which were perpetuating inequality in Chile. And therefore, the government had to move in a completely different direction. So the power of the people is very, very important. But unfortunately, this elite capture has now been extended to the media. Uh, sorry to say that, Nassim, you are an exception, but the anchors now wield too much power and they exhibit their power and they are co-opted as a part of the elite. And that is a, not a countervailing force, but this is now a co-opted force as a part of the extended elite system. Similarly, some of the civil society organization and an exception like HRCP and many others have also been used for personal aggrandizement or personal gains rather than societal gains. So I'm disappointed that the countervailing forces are also entering the same space which they were supposed to demolish. The local government system, I tell you that that was the best thing which can do. 220 million people cannot be ruled in a colonial civil service bureaucratic model from Islamabad, Karachi, Peshawar, Lahore, and Quetta. You have to delegate devolve administrative legal powers along the resources. I give you two examples, Nassim, and you would understand why I am so much passionate about the local governments. I went to Abbottabad District Council. They were doing their budget meeting. There were nominated female work, uh, female members of the council. Very impressive. What they were arguing, was what is dear to you and me. Allocations for education and health and water supply and sewerage and cleanliness in their communities. What were men talking about? They were talking about roads and culverts and bridges and all that, the hardware. The problem lies that unless you have an educated, healthy society, which has the human capital, you're not going to do anything in this country whether it is growth or it is inequality. I went to Shikarpur, where I started my career as the assistant commissioner. I sat down in the back. They didn't know I was there. What they were discussing, one counselor said, I need a girl's school in my village. The other counselor said, look, I already have a school, constructed building, teacher, but there are very few girls. Why don't you? Connect your village with my village with a pathway so that your girls can come in. Now, that is 
empowerment. That is efficient resource use. I like an arrogant civil servant as a secretary planning would allocate 500 schools all over sin, not knowing whether there are teachers or not. So if you really want inequality, give more money to Balochistan's backward districts, to the rural sin districts, let them decide what is good for them. That will be the beginning of the, uh, what I call as a demolition of the, or dismantling of the elite capture. I give you another very sad statistic, and I'm going to write about it. During the 2007, 2008, I look at the statistics of the number of teachers employed in Punjab and Sin. There were 500,000 more uh, in Punjab and also 300,000. Today in 2021, the number of teachers in Punjab and Sin has come down. Why? Because the local governments are in charge of education up to the high school level and they employ teachers and health workers in order to provide the services because they were accountable for the results. So that I think is what is going to give a difference. Karachi, Lahore and Islamabad can take care of all their financial needs by just increasing the property tax and covering the new buildings which are coming up. They don't need any National Finance Commission or Provisional Commission. Give it to Dera Bukti, give it to the Fata areas, give it to Rajanpur, give it to Jacobabad, and you will see that inequality of both regional, gender, and interpersonal would come down. So that is the way I think the local communities and the local governments have to be empowered and given the resources. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ishrit. Uh, you make some very um, interesting, pertinent, and um, you know, uh, relevant to what we are uh, witnessing today in terms of the local government. We are seeing resistance from different provinces in terms of local government, in terms of um, basically devolving authority and financial authority, especially. You know, that debate is continuing, and it's interesting to see the courts of Pakistan, the Supreme Court specifically. Uh, become pretty engaged in that. So uh, it seems that uh, from the center and from the federal level, uh, with your experiences, you still think that it's uh, ultimately we have to look at local government. And in some ways, that's an equivalent to uh, what uh, we had uh, some panelists uh, mention in the earlier webinar and uh, people and they felt like social movements were going to be the response. You are saying the end of social movements is going to be really uh, the power the local government will uh, reduce inequality. Um, well, uh, hopeful and time will tell us, but going back to now, we we'll look at some of the questions that have been raised by, by um, um, participants, uh, somebody wants to know that if Modi has taken back uh, the law on, uh, you know, that was um, the farmers had come out against, if he's done that, does that not tell you that despite him, the, the government being racist, etc., that there's genuine democracy there? Haris, that's for you. Yeah, thank you, Naseem. I think your voice was breaking, but I've read the question. Do and, we have uh, one? Yeah, so, right. Yes, I think uh, I, I'm all for, you, you see, if you follow the, if you start following the constitution in Pakistan, I mean, there are some fundamental rights and some, uh, you know, uh, 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 securities provided to citizens and, and uh, economic security and social securities provided to citizens. We have amended article uh, uh, 25 or 20, uh, the, the one which is about education. We have amended that. We have made it compulsory for children to go to school from uh, year five to from five to 16 years of age. But are we doing that? I mean, there are 22.5 million children of school going age out of school in Pakistan. So if we follow the constitution, 
if we follow the principles of federalism, democracy, and uh, uh, you know, um, a transparent democracy, of course, not a manipulated one. Uh, so federalism, democracy, that will ensure equal citizenship. It will not happen overnight, but it will certainly ensure that. And that is the reason we are also saying that we, we need powerful local governments. We need powerful provincial governments. We need a federation which is effective and efficient. And that is a federal government, I mean. And this is, this is how, these are the, the uh, absolutely, I mean, the, 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 the Meher, I think, I mean, uh, is perfectly right. I mean, it has, it does, it does work in these ways. I mean, elected democracies, whether Modi is, uh, uh, you know, what, whatever the kind of person and his party preaches, um, the, you know, the, the, the uh, the point that it is being run by under a constitution and the point that he's an uh, it is an elected you know a, a democracy which which has regular elections it does mean that people have a voice and that is something that we need to learn from from uh, other countries of you know who have been uh, um, freed from colonial uh, rule uh, 70 years ago from 50 to 70 years ago in the last five to seven decades. And, and you can see that happening. And also statistics are also, um, again, I mean, uh, Ishrit Saab is sitting here, he can correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, the, the growth and inequality, they, we have seen that, uh, you know, under the martial regimes in Pakistan, uh, it has been interestingly, one was under the Cold War, uh, one and, you know, then again, Yaya Khan also. And then the second also, I mean, we got a lot of support and a lot of funding from, uh, from the West uh, to, uh, you know, during the Cold War and to fight Soviets in Afghanistan. And, and then, you know, I mean, there's, there's, been, there's been these injections uh, where, where we see some, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the purchasing power of people uh, increasing, but the, in terms of industrial growth, in terms of investment into people, it has been the, uh, you know, the, the elected governments in Pakistan. And those statistics are very clearly available. And these, these things are important to consider and uh, to um, set the course right. And uh, I, I totally agree with her. Thank you, Naseem. Okay, so uh, I can't resist just, uh, yeah, I said I can't resist just commenting on your comment on India. I think that certainly uh, India is an example in terms of what an unaccountable democracy can do. I mean, it can turn into a majoritarian hell. And I think that's respect to uh, to uh, look at and not learn from when we are looking at India. We have uh, multiple questions coming up, a lot of comments uh, too. So there's a uh, uh, couple of uh, questions um, for you. One, um, that you talk about the power structure and you refer to the bureaucracy, to the police, etc. But that army is very much a part of the power structure in Pakistan. And so what is the degree of responsibility would you give to the army in terms of uh, where Pakistan is today on all the scores that you mentioned, right from governance to garbage collection and so on? I would in fact give no responsibility General to the Khan. army because uh, the army is not responsible for the police or for the law and order. It's responsible for something else and that's what it should be doing. Unfortunately, at places and at times it has to interfere, whether it does it itself or whether it's asked to do it or whether it's forced to do it or whether the environments dictate that it does it, does it. That's a different matter altogether. But the point is this, that even now we're talking about development under civilian rule. The development took place during Ayub's time. You can't say that, what, wish it away. That was the best time that Pakistan's growth was recorded as one of the highest, if we talk about statistics. So I don't want to get into this debate about military, civilian, etc. rule. It's not the military which has really caused the inequalities that we are looking and witnessing today. I was in Bajor where there was an old man sitting there during a battle and I asked him that why are you people so placid that you allow them to come and kidnap your women and children and to bring about this kind of aberration that you see around you. And he looked at me and he said that where were you before this? In fact, where was the, where was the government? There was no government in Fatah. Fatah has been merged with, uh, uh, with the KP province. Nobody asked anybody in Fatah. It's nothing to do with the military. But today you're going to have a problem because of this. Because the people out there were never asked. 
there were there was a simple referendum could have actually addressed the, this issue there are so many other things local bodies we talked about yes i agree local bodies is the best answer but who did the local bodies it's only be done by the military so when you are, are, are forcing me to really try and defend the military it's not about it's not a debate about the military it's a debate about inequality we are talking about people coming on the streets we have people coming on the streets that's why the government keeps on agreeing with them they let go of the tlp that is people on the street this is the kind of people we have so so what are we talking about really the inequality are we going to subsidize mediocrity also in our in our in our in our you know quest to do that today armed magistrates are entering into schools in punjab and questioning and interrogating children whether they know the quran or not this has happened so now how do we how do we address this issue what's the military got to do with that these are governance problems there is a lack of governance or a misuse of governance you can blame the elite you can blame the feudals you can blame anybody else that you want to the cartels but it's always because of violating the standard convention the constitution and the law and the and the law as it stands if the government is not capable of doing this you are going to have inequality well um, uh, i guess yes you're right we shouldn't get into that debate but uh, general tarik uh, if you have 30 years of rule um, uh, in place uh, with the military i mean military rule then it's hard to um you know basically distance yourself from uh, responsibilities of a lack of governance etc it's a whole debate i mean local government was uh, amongst uh, obviously uh, federal governments local governments were also um, you know put an end to by military rule so if yes absolutely if the military stayed in the barracks then all that you said i agree with but when military comes into power uh, play and wields power and makes decisions then it is difficult um for me to uh, entirely agree with uh, you in fact i wouldn't agree with what you just said but anyway i think very quickly can can we have uh, final comments from all the panelists and then i request amara to uh, close the session uh, dr ishra please concluding comments please okay my uh, concluding comments are very simple which is that all segments whether it is the government the private sector or the civil society should have a common determination a common platform in order to tackle the problem of inequality we are so much distracted by blame game yeah. that we do not have our energies together in order to solve these very naughty problems i happen to have been associated with the uh, world bank for china and i tell you the kind of cohesion china from the business community from the private community to the local governments to the federal government to the provincial government is something which is really responsible for where they are 1 plus 1 in china is 11 1 plus 1 in pakistan is minus 1 because we are always trying to pull each other's legs rather than working together in a cohesive and a coordinating manner in order to solve the problem this problem is not really something which we cannot solve but we have to put our heads together and unless we do that a whole of the society approach that we are always talking about army and the civilian and others each one has to be blamed but let's get on with the work for the future and try to put our house in order that is my concluding remark uh, thank you dr ishrat um, haris well thank you very much nasim haris quick comment from you concluding yeah, very- quickly very quickly i think uh, if you if you actually begin i mean with all its weaknesses and with all its you know sukum jo constitution mein hai uske bawajood we'll have to agree to run the country by the constitution that we have and it explains everything it explains how power has to be shared how people have to be included in the decisions that affect their lives and what kind of uh, uh, you know social safety nets and 
protection can be provided to underprivileged citizens and how and why i something that i don't understand is the regional disparity, I mean, I don't want to get into that debate of army versus civilians. I completely understand what General Tarek is saying. But I would just want, would like to remind the, the participants that during General Ayub's period, I mean, I spoke about the, the, the Cold War injection that we got, but, we, but there was a huge disparity between the eastern and the western wings of Pakistan. And there were 22 families that benefited, uh, as, as we all know, and there, it has all been recorded. So, of course, there was growth. I mean, there's, there's no denying that there wasn't growth. But in terms of inequality, they were not addressed. Because Pakistan, again, as I said, whether it is the military rule or whether it is the civilian rule, Pakistan continues to function as a colonial state. And I think the, the constitution with all its problems is still not colonial. It, it, it does guide you to becoming a modern republic. And at least we should, you know, all the institutions of the state, political parties, and all stakeholders should try to stick to the constitution that we have agreed upon as a nation. Thank you. Thank you, Harris. Uh, General Tariq, uh, your concluding comments, please. Well, Nazim, the thing is that, like I, right from the outset, was trying to say, I didn't, don't want to get drawn into this kind of a debate, but the thing is that you probably need to have this debate at some other forum, not this one, but you need to have this debate. And uh, selective you know, uh, quote, quoting from history is not good enough. You have to then have a proper full-fledged debate regarding starting from objective resolution, Justice Munir's report, and what all happened throughout the history of Pakistan, and then we'll come to some conclusion if we really want to do that. But the fact of the matter is we are coming up with suggestions and we are trying to improve the, 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 the inequality situation that exists in Pakistan. And this has existed within our region and it has been experienced by other countries. There, is, there are cases of Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, South Korea, all of these countries were much worse than we were, but they are much better than where we are now. Our, our recommendations are the ones that took them out of the problem. Is this how they improve? Why can't we learn from them? And if we learn from them, we will come to the conclusion that is very far from where we are, what we are suggesting. So, I would suggest that these models should be looked at because they probably apply to us too. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much, uh, General Tariq, and uh, thank you to all the panelists. Um, we'll uh, go over to Amara to conclude. But just let me say that um, this has indeed been a very interesting uh, debate and uh, questions that uh, need to be asked and need to be addressed uh, fundamentally from the perspective that while we have uh, elected representatives in the parliament, the questions of inequality, the fundamental questions that make a society uh, stable, prosperous, uh, civilized are questions that um, remain uh, unanswered to a great extent. But I think we uh, conclude this with the hope that, you know, people like Haris, and um, and other panelists also gave us hope in terms of uh, Dr. Ishrat Hussain spoke about the local government and how that would be a substitute for um, or in fact would be the platform for representing representing the interests and promoting the interests as um, enshrined in the constitution of the weaker in this society of those who are in the uh, you know, in, in the low in the, in the low ladder of the society. Uh, similarly, we have Harris talk about the constitution as one that is, uh, you know, that does give us. Um, uh, it is a model through. If we stay with the constitution, irrespective of its uh, weaknesses, it is one that would address the issues of inequality. And finally, uh, General Tariq uh, talks about the examples that we have in Southeast Asia and look at those and move forward. And perhaps uh, this, uh, this human development report that, um, that uh, UNDP has come up with, and we hope that this discussion and debate will continue and continue at all levels, whether it's uh, within the political circles, within media, within seminars, because this kind of awareness and debate, I think, is very fundamental to change as well. Over to you, Amara. Thank you, everybody. 
Thank you very much, Naseem. Uh, uh, you summed up uh, our esteemed panelists' uh, viewpoints wonderfully. Let me thank you, Naseem, for your excellent uh, moderation, very balanced, and also pressing the key issues where you needed to. Uh, your own wealth of experience and knowledge added uh, much uh, value to this discussion. May I request Resident Representative UNDP Pakistan, Kunot, uh, Mr. Kunot Osby, for a final word before we conclude today's uh, dialogue and debate? Okay, thank you very much. I shouldn't say much on top of uh, uh, this uh, very excellent analysis by all the, the panel members. Uh, and I don't presume to, to know uh, even half of what you know about uh, this uh, uh, issue. But still, let me say a, a couple of words and share a couple of thoughts. Uh, clearly, we have seen in, uh, in the Asia region, in the world, in Pakistan, uh, inequality being a major factor why economic growth is not translated into human well-being as directly as we would want it to be. And, and, and therefore, uh, combating inequality is really central to, to being able to bring everybody on board, uh, to bring everybody on board, not only through, uh, let's say, a charitable approach, but, uh, but through the basic idea that if, uh, if all can be empowered and be productive part of society. Development goes so much faster. Uh, uh, that is one of the key, one of the key aspects. The, uh, there is these uh, observations, the statistics are there, there is an issue, and I hear from all the panelists that there is a very genuine interest in, in dealing with the issue. I, I hope that uh, this kind of dialogue, these ideas will, uh, will help address these issues. Uh, uh, I think General Tarikan was mentioning good governance as part of the solution. I very much agree with that. Uh, and the, this report uh, does make recommendations in that, uh, in that uh, direction about policies, uh, issues relating to tax, issues relating to access to privileges. And um, this is, of course, only some of the ideas that could be put forward to ad address these issues. But, but I think you cannot only regulate it away. There is the other chapter of the report on uh, on people, where you need to look at how people relate to each other, how people relate to vulnerable groups, and and that you can partly regulate, you can partly deal with that through good governance, but you also need to deal with it in the, in another more human dimension. So I think it's it's important uh, to to cover both aspects. Uh, to, uh, uh, well, vote is wrong, to cover all the aspects as good as we can, and, and that all are part of, of doing this, while we, we very clearly address good policies, good governance. Um, and um, so that's maybe my, uh, my, my main idea, that uh, if we can combat inequality, the uh, country and the region and, and the world will go forward and will resolve many of those issues that affect us all. So, but thank you so much for joining this uh, great panel. I think this is just meant as a, as a beginning of a discussion, a discussion that as uh, several panelists said, we need to, to pursue further. Uh, and I hope we can be part of that too. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Knot. Let me just uh, reiterate our sincere gratitude to our esteemed panelists, Dr. Ishat Hussain, uh, General Tariq Khan, Haris Khalek, and our wonderful moderator, uh, Ms. Naseem Zehra, for this excellent uh, session today. This was the final of our Pakistan inequality uh, debates, national webinars around the three Ps, people, policy, power of our NHDR 2020 report, which was launched earlier this year. We've done similar dialogue uh, and advocacy sessions in provinces as well as regions. Uh, this, uh, con this webinar concludes our overall advocacy effort for the NHDR report. But as General Tariq said, we are. Uh, Certainly, I am very heartened uh, by listening to him when he says that this debate needs to be carried forward, maybe not on this platform, but other platforms. And at the end of the day, that has been our core objective. How uh, can our NHDRs contribute to a national uh, sense of policy urgency, 
identifying key issues and taking our recommendations and debates to power corridors and decision makers where it matters and really bring uh, solutions for the benefit of people. With this, we thank our very valued participants and attendees who, who watched our webinar. This will be posted on UNDP Pakistan's official uh, Twitter account also. And you can see the recording of the uh, of the session later on. With this, we thank you for your valuable time and look forward to our next discussion. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.